you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a man telephoning an employment agency to register for job opportunities. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 10. Able Employment, how may I help you? I saw your advertisement in the Daily Gazette. Oh yes. And I'd like to register with you. I'm a student but I've got the long holiday coming up. Certainly. I'll just get the form ready. OK, let me take your details. Sure. Can I have your full name? It's Bowen. James Bowen. B-O-W-E-N. Right. And your address, please? Well, just now I'm staying at the youth hostel. I see. But I'm moving into a flat on Friday. Well, give me that one, then. It's 4 Lion, like the animal, Road, Melford, MF4... 5JB. OK. And then I need to have a phone number for you. Uh, I don't know the number at the flat yet, but I could give you my mobile. That's 09954721822. Would that do? For the time being. But if you can let me know your new number when you can. Of course. Now, qualifications. What qualifications have you got? I mean... Post-16 qualifications. Well, I stayed on at school till 18 and got my A-levels. Fine. Anything else? You said you were a student. Yes, and then I've done two years at college, so I've got my history diploma. Though I don't know how useful that'll be for getting a job. Well, it depends. Everything counts in some way. And I also did an IT course this year, and that got me my computer skills certificate which I certainly hope is relevant. It's different anyway. Um, that's all, really. Hmm, that's quite a good range. And what about on the practical side? What work experience have you got? Well, not too much, because I've mainly been studying. Yes. But two summers ago, I worked just as general assistant in a hospital for about three months. It was quite hard, but very interesting. OK. Anything else? If you include part-time work... Oh, yes. I've often worked in the college holidays as a tour guide, showing visitors round. That's quite enjoyable, meeting people. I'm sure. Hmm. Now on to interests. There's space here for two. What would you say? Two? Uh, well, I like various sports, but I suppose we should put that I'm in the swimming club. I'm pretty committed to that. Yes, that sounds good. And for the other one, something different? I'm very keen on music too, and I love playing piano. I've been doing that for over ten years now. Yes, I'll put that down. Well, that's more or less it for the time being. Uh -huh. Just one more thing. What I do need is your availability. Oh, yes. Um, the college term finishes on June the 20th and then I'm going to visit my parents. But I can be back and ready to start on June the 28th, if that seems OK. I'm sure it is. 
Now, what happens next is that I process this information. And then... That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear the organiser of a group holiday talking to the group before they arrive at their destination. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 16. Thank you everybody for your attention. I hope you're all looking forward to arriving at the town. I thought you might like to know a few things while we're still on the coach and it'll help to pass the time on our journey. OK, as you know, we're staying at the Park Hotel. It's comfortable and friendly. We're booked in for three nights. Now, I'm aware that not everyone wants breakfast there, so if you do want it, you should tell the hotel that you do the night before. We're making our own arrangements for dinner each evening, and there's a cafe open at the hotel most of the time if you want a drink or a snack. There's also a very pleasant lounge on the ground floor with a collection of fascinating paintings. And then I hope you're going to enjoy the various activities that are lined up. However... I do have to tell you that there have been some changes since the original programme. For one, because it's been restored and is therefore closed to the public, we won't be going to the castle after all, I'm afraid. However, there's plenty else to see and the gardens are still open. Something we've been able to add to the programme is for Saturday, when a local historian will give us a lecture on famous people from the town. I don't know who that includes yet... So, to free up the time for that, we've made another little amendment and changed the trip to the antique show that was due for then on to Sunday. Actually, I think that'll make for a more relaxed programme anyway. We're leaving the rest of Sunday free for you to wander around as you wish. One place you might like to try is the art gallery, because it's got a huge display of old postcards. You can't really send them home to your family and friends, but it's interesting and sometimes funny to see what people used to send. Well, um, that's the lot on changes. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 17 to 20. I thought it could be useful to try and get your bearings now before we actually arrive, so I'll give you a few pointers on your maps. OK, um, first things first, the Park Hotel, because I assume you'll want to deposit your luggage before anything else, will be driving into the town from the west and stopping at the bus station. To get to the hotel, just go straight down the high street towards the railway bridge and after the bridge, if you go left, you'll soon see it on the right. As I say, it's a nice place. You can check in, see your rooms, relax a little. There are a couple of interesting little shops nearby. There aren't any internet facilities at the hotel, I'm afraid, so if you want to send any emails, you'll need to get yourselves to the internet cafe. In fact... If you want to do that first, it's easy because it's near the bus station, 
on the corner towards the right of Curtis Lane and Cramer Street. So once you've done that, well, if you do that, then I suppose you'll be ready to do a bit of exploring. You've got your basic maps, but you may want to get more information, and the tourist information office is the place to do that. It's up around the train station area. From the bus station, you could go up any of the streets to the left: Cadogan Road, Earl Street, or Duke Street. The office is directly facing the train station on the corner with Earl Street. They've got all sorts of brochures and leaflets about local attractions and tickets for sale. They even sell some locally produced jams and chocolates. And a last pointer at this stage is our venue for dinner tonight: the Royal House Restaurant. This is conveniently located in the very centre of town. In fact, you'll no doubt pass it as you're walking around beforehand. In relation to the bus station, it's not far. Going down the high street, if you pass the corner with Cromwell Road, then the next junction is a crossroads with Duke Street and Runton Road, and it's there. You'll be able to see its rather grand entrance over on the left corner. The food and the service there are both excellent, so. It promises to be an enjoyable evening. Well,、uh, we're just coming into the town now, so. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three, you will hear a conversation between an undergraduate student, David, and his tutor, Dr. Smith, about David's plans for doing a master's degree. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Right. Well, David, I think it's a good idea to talk a little about your plans for going on to do an MA. Now, I understand you're thinking in terms of either Forth College or Haynes College. That's right. Well, so far, anyway. No, I think that's a good choice to have narrowed it down to. I'm interested to know how the services to support students work in both places. Yes, I know you've needed to make use of those here in the last year. I have to say, I'm not absolutely sure about the situation at Haynes. I expect they're all right, but certainly Forth has a good reputation in that regard. They have a large number of students from abroad, and they have to make sure they're okay. That's reassuring. And then I'll be moving city again, obviously, whichever college I go to. And I hope that the room or flat I could expect would be nice. Very important. Yes, these days actually, all colleges tend to have decent quality rooms or flats for their students, and Forth and Haynes are no exception. Right. Well, what about comparisons on the academic side of things? Hmm. Well, I know you're an avid user of the limited online provision we have here. I think you'll find Haynes is about as developed, <laughs> or not, as we are here, and that Forth has developed some pretty impressive stuff, which I'm sure you'd make the most of. Well, I'd certainly try. But that doesn't mean that the more traditional information sources, such as the good old-fashioned library, should be forgotten. No, of course not. While Forth has recently had a very splendid law library opened, that isn't particularly relevant for you, and I think you'd find Haynes' general university and faculty collections better suited to your needs. But that's something you could check for yourself if you visit both places, which I'm planning to do next month. Good. Now there's the question of the lecturing staff, which is clearly going to be key to your progress. 
I think you'd find them adequate at Forth. There are some solid people working there. Uh, while Haynes have recently taken on some inspirational people, very cutting edge. <laughs> it's a little hard to judge, though, because as a research student, it's not as if you have teaching all day, every day. No, I guess not. But I'll need to consult. Yes, and on the subject of research... In terms of the college's reputation for results, again, neither place is bad in any way, but I think you'll find, and you can check this on the Research Council's website, that Haynes has consistently scored very well. There's perhaps a little bit of an issue with non-completing doctorate students at Forth. Well, I'll certainly look at the website as you suggest. <laughs> Fine. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm still a bit anxious about making this next step. I know the level of competition is very high, especially in my area. It makes me feel rather daunted. And I wonder if in a new place I may be out on my own, if you know what I mean, compared to the sense of community here. I suppose it'll be down to my determination to succeed to get me through. Hmm. Well, do remember how you felt when you arrived here. I'm sure you'll get on anywhere in the end. I hope so. And, of course, you still don't know exactly where you want to end up. By the time you've completed your Masters, you'll have a clearer idea of whether you want to progress to doctorate level. It's possible, I suppose, that you'll begin to see how much you might be interested in picking up some bits of lecturing earlier than that, since your area is fairly specialised and may put you in demand sooner than you think. To establish yourself in your area of expertise... It would be sensible to think in terms of getting your stuff into one or two of the journals, converting parts of your dissertation into suitable formats for them. That'll stand you in good stead, whatever else you decide to do. That sounds like good advice. Thanks. Actually, I think master's level studying has improved in some ways over the last few years. <laughs> the internet you love so much was always going to make all kinds of studying easier. Or that's the idea, anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure it really has the impact you might think. What I've found impressive is the way courses have developed to be more adaptable, more able to fit in with all the other demands in people's lives. So, while the exams and assignments you all have to do may not have shifted much, at least a wider range of students are now able to benefit from education at the higher levels. Mm. I just wish I could be sure I was always making the best use of my opportunities. At the end of each week, I usually feel I could have got more done, arranged things differently, been more efficient somehow. I've got a lot better at taking down notes during seminars and lectures, which means, I think, that my written work has benefited to some degree, so there's progress on some fronts at any rate. <laughs> yes, it's interesting See, That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a writer giving a talk about the different kinds of writing that the audience might want to try doing. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40.
So I'm now going to say a few words about the various different kinds of writing you may want to consider. Each has its own challenges and rewards, and it's really a question of seeing what suits you best. There are no rights and wrongs here. Let's start by considering the short story. Remember that a short story isn't just a very concise novel. There are three basic styles: the story itself, the slice of life section, and the surprise type. And all of them are equally valid as treatments of the genre. When producing a short story, you don't have time for a slow build-up of interest. So you need to get in there straight away and begin with a crisis. Then there's non-fiction, which can sell very well, with biographies in particular frequently hitting the bestseller lists. It's important, however, to be sure your chosen topic is genuinely interesting to people, and you know enough about it to do it justice. So when you're submitting your idea to a publisher. It's worthwhile to give them details of specialist knowledge you have. What about articles? Now, this is a very wide area, of course, going from the very learned and obscure to the populist gossip type. Articles based on giving advice are a proven area, and to give them a sufficient focus, you should produce your article for a definite market. That will help to define your purpose. Turning to something different, there's the question of poetry. It's often hard to define what poetry is exactly. Maybe it's easier to say what it isn't, but it should be subtle. So the message of a poem oughtn't to be overly obvious. True poems let the ideas sit there for the reader to ponder. What they must do is sound good, like singing. So. I recommend reading what you write aloud to yourself to check the melody. Well, then there's plays, which are basically novels, but told only through conversation. A playwright includes minimal instructions for actions, but not for every small action the actors will perform. Things such as moves towards sofa and so on are for the director to come up with. If you're thinking of trying your hand at a play, a good starting point would be to educate yourself a little in the art of acting, so that you know what the people who deliver your work can and can't do with it. What next? There's radio, of course. Radio uses an enormous range of material, and the BBC Writing for Radio Handbook contains information about all of this. To begin with. I suggest regional stations for sending your stuff to. The competition for national radio is extremely high. Okay, another interesting area is children's literature. Now, very few, if any, children's books are published without pictures, but this doesn't mean that you, as writer, have to draw them. That's for the illustrator. What you do need to do is be clear who you want to write for. So fix on one age group, and then aim your stories at that. Right, I've saved what I consider to be the best and the hardest till last: the novel, very long and very difficult to do well, but certainly not impossible, as any bookshop shelves will confirm. One of the first things to decide is from what point of view you will tell your story. A popular choice is the first person, and this technique certainly gives a sense of immediacy for the reader. While many new writers find it easier to project themselves into their main character if they can write in his or her name, but that assumes, of course, that the main character is somehow like the writer, which may or may not be the case. Meanwhile. If your book is all narrated by I, you can only put into your story things which are experienced by that character, which may prove to be rather restricting. Now there are all sorts of pitfalls for the novelist, and many of them relate to the issue of providing a balanced narrative. Every time you introduce a character into the story, you have decisions to make. 
Of course, you want to populate your landscape with a variety of people to maintain interest, but don't feel you have to decorate every one of them in elaborate detail. The same goes for irony. All too often, an inexperienced writer will create a strong ironic situation, and then spoil it by spelling out what they mean by it, as if readers were too stupid to understand. A few contrasting details should serve to make the point clear. A big challenge for new novelists is dialogue. What is the relationship between conversation as people really speak, and as it is in novels? Well, it depends. If you recorded actual conversations and copied them straight into your narrative, readers would get confused and bored. All those unfinished sentences going nowhere. On the other hand, you don't want to write out page-long utterances by characters, as these will seem unrealistic to an extreme. But you can insert minor descriptions and actions to vary the pace and add interest. Well, I hope what I'm saying is encouraging and not too off-putting about the various difficulties. Are there any questions at this point? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.